Okay, thank you very much everybody for uh, joining us uh, this morning for the Free HR Matters Whistleblowing at Work seminar. My name is Tom Draper, I'm Director and Head of Employment in the Sheffield office at Freeds, and I am joined for this webinar this morning by two members of my team, uh, Elizabeth Ferguson, who's a Managing Associate, and Lee Williams, who's an Associate. So normally uh, we do monthly HR Matters seminars uh, in Sheffield, um, but this morning I'm very pleased to say uh, Freeds have chosen the Sheffield office to do the National Employment uh, seminar. So um, we are joined by a wider group of people than, than our normal uh, cohort of regular delegates, which is brilliant. Uh, I can see that we've got nearly 70 people logged on at the moment, which is fantastic. So um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will have the option to do uh, a question and answer session at the end. Um, with that in mind, whilst we're speaking, if you do have anything to ask us, please put uh, your questions in either the Q&A or the chat function, uh, and we will come to those questions at the end. We've deliberately put some time aside so we can answer as many of your questions as possible. Uh, there were some questions that were sent in before the webinar as well, uh, and we will also answer those at the end. So, why whistleblowing? Well, we try and make our seminars topical for our clients, and uh, there has been anecdotal evidence within Freets of an increase in whistleblowing um, allegations and whistleblowing claims, and also applications for interim relief, which I'm going to talk to you about at the end of the webinar this morning. And we believe that this is as a result of the pandemic and the increase in um, health and safety uh, allegations and concerns that employees are raising and also in relation to other allegations, particularly around the use of furlough by employers. And we are seeing an increase anecdotally, but there is also wider national evidence of more whistleblowing complaints being made. So we thought we would take a closer look at what's happening here. And so um, we looked at, at, at that. And um, if Tom could put the next slide up, um, we'll be able to see what we're going to uh, cover this morning. So firstly, uh, we've got a quick up update on the government coronavirus job retention scheme. Uh, and as uh, regular viewers of these webinars will know, it's very difficult to uh, avoid coronavirus. Uh, and the government's most recent response to it. Uh, but it will, uh, it is important for us and it's important for you to go through what the government have uh, announced recently in respect of furlough. And so that's where we're going to start before we're looking at whistleblowing in a bit more detail. So we're going to look at how common whistleblowing is, um, and then we're going to look at the rise of whistleblowing complaints in the era of COVID-19. Uh, Elizabeth is then going to look at the who, what, where, and when of whistleblowing. Uh, and then I'm going to cover off health and safety whistleblowing complaints and applications for interim relief. And then we're going to wrap it all up uh, for you with some helpful tips and takeaways that you can go back to your organisation with to ensure that you're best placed to deal with issues relating to whistleblowing at work. So um, thank you all for listening to the introduction. I am now going to hand on to Lee Williams, who's going to take you through uh, the latest government support. We could have the next slide. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, well, a lot's been happening over the last few weeks, hasn't it? On the last month in our webinar, we were talking about tiers and job support scheme and all the rest of it. 
And since then, we've been thrown into a month-long national lockdown and everywhere is closed again. Um, we've also learned that the government intends to continue with the coronavirus job retention scheme or furlough scheme, as most of us know it by, um, until the 31st of March 2021 at the least. Um, at the same time as extending the furlough scheme, um, the government shelved uh, the job support scheme and the £1,000 job retention bonus. Uh, the government's not provided yet um, any further information about whether it will redeploy the job support scheme. Um, but as stated in relation to the bonus, that a retention incentive will be deployed at the appropriate time. Um, whether this will be in the form of a bonus or something different, we don't know yet. That's just something we'll just have to wait and see. Um, so for the time being, at least, it looks like the government's sticking with the furlough scheme. I don't intend to go into too much detail about the mechanics of the scheme, um, as we all pretty much know how it works by now. But I will highlight some of the main headlines that we can take um, up to now. So as previously mentioned, the scheme's intended to run until the 31st of March 2021. In order to qualify to make a claim under the scheme, an employer does not need to have used the previous scheme, uh, the furlough scheme previously. Uh, so an employee can actually be furloughed for the first time under the extended scheme. However, for an employee to qualify for support, they must have been on their employer's payroll. And the key date here is the 30th of October 2020. So even if an employee was employed before that date, if an RTI submission has not been made by the 30th of October, then unfortunately, uh, they will not qualify for support. Um, the government has also made a condition this time that in order to claim a grant, um, an employee must accept that HMRC uh, will publish information about the scheme on the internet. And up to now, we know that that will include the name of the employer making the claim and also a um, reasonable indication of the amount claimed. I don't think this is intended at sort of naming and shaming employees for using support. Um, but it's more geared towards combating furlough fraud, as it's been reported this was quite widespread um, in the initial stage of the furlough scheme. Um, the guidance states that it may be possible for employees, uh, employers to rehire previously redundant employees and put them on furlough leave. <coughs> the guidance states that an employer can do this for employees that are on their payroll um, on the 23rd of September 2020. Obviously, for many employees, this is not going to be straightforward um, and there'll be practical issues to consider. Um, for example, the business outlook in the medium to long term. There's also likely to be legal issues with doing this. Um, for example, if an employer has already paid redundancy payments to these employees. Um, also, there's uh, legal issues around the continuity of the employment and whether their employment will continue or will be starting from fresh. Um, we're a bit unsure about how these things work at the minute. So if you do need, uh, if you do plan on rehiring employees, you should get advice from us first and um, so we can look at these risks. <laughs> like in previous months, um, under the scheme, employers will be able to flexibly furlough their employees. This means that employers can furlough employees for any amount of time or shift pattern um, in agreement with the employee and claim a grant for the usual hours that the employee will not be working. As I said, it's important to get this agreement in writing. Um, if you've previously made an agreement under the job support scheme, it's likely that this will not be enough and you'll need to get a fresh agreement with that employee under the revised scheme. The government's been keen to stress the importance of record keeping and the guidance states that all employers should keep this record for five years um, for inspection by H HMRC if that, if that arises. Until at least uh, the 31st of January, uh, the government contribution to the extended scheme is going to be 80% of wages for the hours not worked, and that's capped at two and a half grand a month. Like before, employers can top this amount up as they wish, but uh, that's not a requirement uh, to claim support under the scheme. Beyond January, we don't actually know what the contributions will be, and it's likely that the government's looking to see how things pan out before then, and uh, before deciding what level of contribution they think will be necessary. <coughs> Unlike under the previous scheme, however, this time employers will be responsible for all um, national, uh, employer national insurance contributions and pension contributions. So even for hours that are not worked, unfortunately, employers cannot claim for those under the extended scheme. Another key change under the extended scheme is that from 1st of December onwards, employers cannot claim a contribution towards notice pay. So, as you know, under the previous scheme, employers could make staff redundant and use the furlough scheme to subsidise notice payments during the notice period. Um, that's not allowed from the 1st of December under the new scheme. So that's something that you will need to factor into consideration if you are planning redundancies in the short to medium term future. 
And that, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about the furlough scheme for now. Um, if you do have any questions, um, pop them into the chat, as Tom says, or if, if you'd rather us get back to you with an individual response, our contact details are going to be on the final slide, so you can drop us an email and we'll get back to you with that response as soon as we can. Um, so the focus of the remainder of the session is going to be whistleblowing. So Tom, if we can have the, the next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> So before Elizabeth takes you through the law around whistleblowing and the steps that um, can be taken to avoid whistleblowing claims, I'm going to start by present, presenting some interesting statistics and to highlight um, the pertinence of whistleblowing uh, in the midst of the pandemic. So the statistics on the slide have been taken from a study conducted by the whistleblowing charity Protect. And for those who don't know, Protect um, is a charity which operates um, an advice line for workers with whistleblowing concerns, so they can ring Protect and um, get advice if their employer's um, committing wrongdoing or they want to know their rights in relation to whistleblowing and Protect will help employees. Protect also offers help to employers as well. Um, for example, it gives training to employers on how to investigate whistleblowing disclosures and how to spot them. So in order to highlight the plight of whistleblowers during the pandemic, uh, Protect examined data from its advice line, uh, so from the calls it received between March and September this year. And from this data, Protect found the following. So this one's not on the slide, but 62% uh, of uh, COVID-19 related calls were in relation to furlough fraud. And this mostly came from small employers of between 1 and 49, uh, 1 and 49 workers. And half of those who did contact protect had not previously raised this issue with their employer before um, they'd just gone straight to protect and one of the main reasons for this is probably um, scared of the consequences um, with the economic turmoil um, and the chance of repercussions for raising these concerns and many workers feel that they need to go straight to protect before raising these issues internally first of those workers who did raise any COVID-19 related whistleblowing uh, disclosure to their employer. 41% uh, of them said that their employer ignored their concerns and perhaps more shockingly 20% of those who did raise concerns say that they were dismissed as a result. Remember this is an account given by the workers themselves, these are not tribunal or HMR stats so they're not necessarily going to translate into successful claims in the tribunal. But the fact that one in five workers consider that their dismissal was because they made a whistleblowing disclosure should be quite uh, concerning for employers. And in light of its findings, Protect has recommended uh, the introduction of a legal standard on employers to have whistleblowing arrangements in place, including a requirement to give whistleblowers feedback um, it, when they do raise a concern. Protect has also suggested a penalty regime should be implemented where an organisation could be fined or sanctioned for not complying with these standards. Uh, most organisations including most of you on the call, will probably already have these systems and policies in place for deal, dealing with whistleblowing disclosures, such as a whistleblowing policy or something similar. And you may even train staff on how to use these policies. And most, if not all of you, are probably sitting there thinking, well, our organisation would never sack someone for reporting fraud or raising a health and safety concern. Um, so it's easy to become um, overly confident that this is not an issue what's going to affect your organisation. However, not all whistleblowing disclosures are actually submitted on a piece of paper with a whistleblowing disclosure in bold at the top. Um, in fact, most of them are made in more subtle ways, which might be within correspondence or in a, in a sort of heat of the moment verbal exchange, and then it's forgotten about and not actually re recognised as a whistleblowing disclosure. And then this is forgotten about, and then later on, um, the disclosure raises its ugly head. Um, for example, if an employee is made redundant, and then they make an association, which might be completely unfounded, but the employee's version of events is, I was dismissed because I made a disclosure. And we are seeing that more happen more and more as um, the pandemic goes on. So um, it's, it's important that employers are able to spot these whistleblowing disclosures. So they're able to respond and deal with these appropriately and effectively. <clears throat> And this is an area what we're going to be covering in more detail and later on in today's webinar. And on that note, I'm now going to hand you over to Elizabeth, who will be conducting the next part of the webinar. So thanks for listening to my segment and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's session. Cheers, Tom. Thanks, Lee. That was really um, helpful and informative and good to get a bit of background context in terms of what we're talking about. So um, I arguably we have the slightly drier part of the seminar today in terms of taking you through the legal framework. Um, what are we talking about when we are discussing a whistleblowing complaint? What is it? Who can bring it? And when? 
um, within, as I said, the, the legalities of it. In a nutshell, whistleblowing involves speaking out against wrongdoing in your workplace in a way which qualifies you for legal protection. You know, that's the kind of headline in terms of um, how whistleblowing is understood, but it's got a lot of components to it. So I'll do my best over the next 20, 25 minutes to break it down a little bit more. The starting point is that a worker within your organisation has to make a complaint, um, what I'll go on to call a protected disclosure, so sort of the, the formal terminology, about one of six types of potential failures um, by the employer. Firstly, um, that the employer has committed a criminal offence, that's obviously quite an obvious one, um, or there has been a miscarriage of justice, or, and this is particularly pertinent in you know, the current context and something Tom will talk about a little bit more um, later on in the seminar, a danger to the health and safety of any individual. So COVID complaints are, are likely to squarely fall within that category. Um, or there could be an allegation about damage to the environment. Or lastly, and this is the one which is most widely used by workers because it's you know, the breadth of what can fall within it, that there has been some form of breach of a legal obligation. You know, that's very wide and case law has shown that it can concern um, an employer's breach of the worker's own employment contract if the other relevant parts of the whistleblowing complaint tick the, the legal boxes. So um, they're, they're broad categories, often they're overlapping um, and in, uh, a worker might suggest that the complaint falls within one or more of them. Um, but it's not that difficult for an employee in, in most situations to show that the complaint, if it's sufficiently serious, if, it's, if it involves some form of legal offence, falls within one of the six relevant categories or they can argue that there's been a deliberate concealing of information about any of those. Importantly, um, the complaint can concern the conduct of the employer um, or an employee, so one of the individual's colleagues within the workplace, or some other third party. So, um, you know, if you have um, some people within your workforce who you send off to a client's premises, if that client is breaching a legal obligation or committing some kind of act that falls within the above categories, then um, again, that can form a whistleblowing complaint, or it could be as, as, as casual, or apparently casual as, you know, I saw John Smith, my manager, in Tesco at lunch without a mask on in breach of, you know, COVID regulations. Um, if they then you know, explain in terms of the health and safety risk that they believe that, that creates, again, potentially a whistleblowing complaint. The key message here, though, is that complaints which qualify as whistleblowing and therefore special legal protection, and this is a point that Lee's already made, don't usually come labelled as such. You know, it would be great if every employer came up to you, um, you know, with a nicely typed up letter with whistleblowing complaint right at the top, um, saying, stating at the outset that they consider themselves to be blowing the whistle and they'd like it to be treated as such. That's simply not what happens in practice. The complaint doesn't need to be in writing um, and it certainly doesn't need to be done in a formal basis. It can be you know, a casual conversation between an employee and their manager in the staff kitchen about you know, inadequate social distancing in the workplace. That again could constitute a protected disclosure for the purposes of whistleblowing. So knowing how to spot it when it can in practice be quite difficult to spot and then what to do if it is a whistleblowing complaint is really important. And then knowing the steps of what to do, but also importantly, what not to do in relation to the individual that's brought that complaint to your attention. The second point that I just want to make at the outset is, and this slightly contradicts what I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about, but don't try not to get too hung up on the, you know, the very specific legal detail of whistleblowing law. The overarching approach is to just be reasonable in terms of how you're dealing with the complainant. Um, and the information that they brought to your attention. And if you're doing that, the chances are you're probably not getting it too wrong. If you take a sort of quite forensic approach at the outset and try and sort of pull apart in terms of whether it would qualify as a you know, protected disclosure in the eyes of the law, come to the conclusion it doesn't, and then potentially treat that individual to some form of detriment because of that, you know, treat them less favorably, the chances are that you're setting yourself up for a claim either because you've got it wrong in terms of your analysis and it can be a difficult analysis to make right at the outset or because another potential claim could come in you know the most likely being constructive and dismissal if that employee has at least two years service so 
bearing the word reasonable in mind is not going to um is going to ensure that you don't stray too far off in terms of how you should be dealing with it that aside though it is important to know when it does qualify for specific whistleblowing protection in particular if you're potentially facing a claim in this area so i'm just going to break down now in terms of the different components um of when a worker is protected if they made a protected disclosure so that you're better armed if that does arise in your workplace so um the first point to make on this is that you have to be a worker to receive protection under whistleblowing legislation it's a very sort of broad statutory framework and a worker you know it's the general interpretation of worker effectively they work for you they have to provide personal service and are not genuinely self-employed i.e. in business on their own account, you know, you're not their client, they're likely to be considered a worker and they're likely to have whistleblowing protection. But importantly, the definition for worker in the Employment Rights Act, which is the, you know, the piece of legislation that provides the relevant protection, is wider for whistleblowing protection than it is for other protections under the Act. So you have you know, the general definition of workers, but you also specifically, and case law has set this out as well, um, have LLP members who would be considered as, as workers for the purpose of whistleblowing, former workers, if they're then subjected to a detriment, um, for instance, a negative reference, again, they have protection under the Act, and agency workers, um, again, are sort of specifically listed as, as qualifying for protection. And agency workers is wider than perhaps the usual understanding of, of the sort of traditional agency worker relationship. So, anyone supplied by an intermediary to your organization provided they've not set the terms themselves in terms of the contract will probably be considered an agency worker and therefore protected so you could you know, have a, a high level say it contractor in your organization who works under a personal services company but has been provided via an employment business to you so via an intermediary again, they would be protected if, if a um, protected disclosure has, has been made. So if you look to terminate their contract because they brought a protected disclosure to your attention, then the chances are you could find yourself facing a whistleblowing claim. It also does mean in practice that you could potentially have two employers who um, could face a claim for whistleblowing from the same individual if they're both considered to be you know, um, an employer for the purposes of the Act. Um, Job applicants are generally excluded. Um, the exception to that is NHS job applicants. So if you work for an NHS organisation, bear that in mind. You know, that was you know, on public policy grounds introduced as a, an exception to that rule. Um, there's also you know, a lot of legal discussion in terms of whether the applicants exception will be extended to those related, um, working in children's social care for local authorities. It hasn't come in yet, but I would expect it to come in in the next year or two. But other than that, job applicants aren't protected um, under the legislation. Volunteers and interns also fall outside of it, as do non-executive directors and office holders, though there is a notable exception for judges, so we'll have to wait to see whether that's widened as well in the future. Um, and again, you know, the genuinely self-employed um, don't have any particular legal protection, as is the case for a lot of employment rights that they fall outside of. But other than that, anyone that constitutes a worker within your organisation is going to have the protection, irrespective of how long they've been with you. So it's important to bear in mind that this is a day one right in terms of whistleblowing protections. If I could just have the next slide, Tom, thank you. So, um, what do we mean when we talk about protected disclosures? What does an employee actually have to do to get protection under um, whistleblowing law? So firstly, they have to make <coughs> something called a qualifying disclosure. And I'll break down what that means. And secondly, that has to be made to an appropriate person or body. So which disclosures qualify? Um, a qualifying disclosure is any disclosure of information which in the reasonable belief of the worker making the disclosure is made in the public interest and tends to show one or more of the types of wrongdoing or failure, um, which I mentioned above, you know, the breach of legal obligation or the criminal offence or the environmental damage, whatever it might be. So you need to have a reasonable belief that there is, has been or will be wrongdoing within the workplace and a reasonable belief that the disclosure that you've made is in the public interest. 
So if we just start off with the disclosure of information component. So the worker has to come to you and communicate some form of information or depart, impart some information to you. Merely gathering evidence, um, you know, if they're trying to collate the information, the evidence together to be able to make that disclosure or threatening to make a disclosure is unlikely to be sufficient. Um, if, and, and that's quite an important distinction because if the employee's actions in gathering the evidence or obtaining the evidence involves some form of misconduct, for instance, there's been a couple of high profile cases about employees secretly filming within the workplace, then in theory, you can separate that out um, from the protected disclosure that they then make and take disciplinary action in relation to that misconduct if it's just in relation to collating the information together. Two red flags here though, um, if that's something, a scenario that you have faced or you face in, in the future. Firstly, you have to be very clear in your processes and evidence that you're acting on the basis of the employee's misconduct, not because they were trying to evidence a protected disclosure. You need to be able to separate out the two and often it's quite difficult to do that in practice. Secondly, um, there's been um, a, a recent ET case, so it's just a first instance case um, called Billsborough versus Berry Marketing Services Limited that suggested, and this is you know, somewhat controversial, that an employer who subjects an employee to a detriment because they are about to make a disclosure, so they haven't already made it, but they are about to, or they're considering, or you know, they're taking preparatory steps to make a disclosure, um, could still be liable um, under the whistleblowing legislation, even if that disclosure has not yet been made. Now, the argument in that case is that you need to stop employers being able to prevent an employee from blowing a whistle in that regard to give effect to the right of freedom of expression under the European Convention of Human Rights. It's controversial because legally it's probably not correct, um, certainly on a technical basis. It certainly fulfills the purpose of the legislation in terms of worker protection, but it doesn't squarely fall within the wording of the law. So we'll have to wait to see what happens with that in the future, whether you know a similar case on, um, on those grounds is appealed and a higher court can consider it. But it's certainly a warning note to employers that just because the information has not yet been disclosed, but you become aware the disclosure is likely to be made, doesn't mean that you're free to act however you might want to, um, because in that tribunal's opinion anyway, the employee is still qualified for protection. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the disclosure information doesn't need to be in writing, often it's not, it might just be part of a conversation or come up in a team meeting. Most employees, you know, if they're being savvy about it, will put it in writing because it, you know, it takes away a bit of a hurdle in terms of proving that the disclosure was made later down the line if it does become a claim. But there's no requirement to do it. Um, and nine out of 10 employees in a lot of organizations just simply won't think to necessarily put it in writing. And I said, it might just, it might just be something that they verbally raise. So watch out for that as well. Um, it does, though, importantly, have to be more than just a general allegation. So it needs to communicate some form of fact and be suffic um, sufficiently specific. So if an employee, if one of your employees states to their manager that they're concerned that you, you know, as a company aren't complying with health and safety requirements, in theory, that's unlikely to be enough to constitute a, a qualifying disclosure. But if they go on to say, because social distancing measures are not in place or because appropriate PPE has not been provided, um, then that is a disclosure of information. It's more than just a mere allegation. And therefore, again, you know, it gets over that the hurdle. I mean, obviously it's dangerous though to ignore the first example where just a generic concern is raised. Firstly, because you know, just from a good practice point of view, you know, it's, it's always advisable to get to the bottom of whatever that complaint is. Um, you know, is there an actual health and safety issue within your workplace or uh, financial irregularity or whatever it might be so that it can be remedied. But secondly, from a, a sort of legal perspective, um, it might well be that, that individual has gone on to provide the specific information to someone else or through another channel, and therefore it does um, amount to a qualifying disclosure. So if you ignore it, or certainly if the individual is then subject to a detriment because of it, they might well have a claim, even if you were not initially aware that that, um, that specific information had been provided. Um, the second component, so we've got our disclosure of information. What then makes it a qualifying disclosure? Well, the worker must reasonably believe that the information they have disclosed 
you know, as I said, the specific facts that they've disclosed tends to show one or more of the relevant failures, which I talked to you through earlier, so the breach of legal obligation or whatever it might be, that it is taking place, has taken place, or is likely to take place. So importantly, the information disclosed doesn't have to be true. Um, it's all about the reasonable belief of the employee. And it doesn't even actually have to fall into one of those relevant categories of wrongdoing. The worker just needs to reasonably believe that it does tend to show one of those relevant failures. So they could have got it completely wrong, but if they have that reasonable belief, they're going to be um, have done enough to tick that box. So it does have to be more than just unsubstantiated rumours, though. Uh, yes, they have to subjectively have the belief, but the, the individual in question also blog has got to exercise some judgment um, in, consistent with the other evidence available to them. So it does have to be a reasonable belief. There is an objective element to the test. Um, so there must be some information which tends to show that the specified mal, you know, the malpractice has occurred or may occur, but they certainly don't have to prove it. Um, and they don't even have to prove that they definitely believe it to be true. They just have to have that reasonable belief. Perhaps the harder, the harder hurdle for workers to get over is to, that they then need to go on to show, they're going to bring a claim on this basis, that the information they disclosed was in the public interest. But again, they only have to have a reasonable belief that it was in the public interest. Now, this was introduced um, back in, I think, 2013 to try and quell the rise in whistleblowing complaints relating solely to workers' alle um, allegations of a breach of their own contract. So my employer X um, hasn't paid me my contractual bonus and therefore I'm blowing the whistle because they've breached their legal obligation to do so. Um, so the government introduces new requirements saying it has to clearly be in the public interest or reasonable belief in the public interest to qualify um, as a potential protective disclosure. But case law has simply slightly toned that down a little bit because um, a complaint can still qualify, a, a complainant can still qualify for whistleblowing protection if they showed that they're blowing the whistle on um, a breach of their own contract or contractual obligations was still in the public interest. And the famous example of that is Cheston Global Limited versus Numo, um, Numo Mohammed, when the employee raised complaints regarding his commission income. So he worked for a, a large um, estate agent, you know, very well-known estate agent, and he didn't feel like he was getting his proper commission income because of financial irregularities within the, um, the way the accounts were done within the company. But cleverly, when he raised his complaint, he did so as part of a wider complaint about manipulation of the company's accounts, which he said impacted on his commission, not only his, but 100 other senior managers in his position. Um, and more pertinently, perhaps, he was arguing that the company's wider shareholders and HMRC were also impacted because of these financial irregularities. So because he put it on that wider basis, both in terms of his colleagues, but also you know, others outside the organisation, he was able to get up the hurdle of showing that he had a reasonable belief that it was in the public interest to make the disclosure and it was found to be protected. Um, I mean, the courts have in that case and since given a little bit of guidance in terms of whether or not a disclosure is likely to be in the public interest. Um, there's four main considerations. So firstly, it's, it's a numbers game. How many people other than the complainant are affected by the alleged breach? The lower the numbers, the more, um, the more serious the alleged breach needs to be to get over this hurdle. Secondly, you know, the seriousness of the breach itself. Again, you know, if it's something extremely serious or hazardous potentially to um, to, to the, the general public, then clearly, um, or, or just a large number of people within that organisation itself, then clearly it's more likely to be um, constituted a protected disclosure. The size of the organisation, so larger and more prominent organisations in terms of you know, your staff numbers, your suppliers, your clients, your shareholders, the more likely that a disclosure about your activities will be considered to be in the public interest, even if it just in, involves your internal activities. And lastly, the nature of the alleged wrongdoing. So if the whistleblower is saying that the wrongdoing was deliberate, again, it's more likely to get over the public disclosure threshold. So whether or not it is a protected disclosure will then depend on who the disclosure is made to. So we've got a disclosure of information, which is a qualifying disclosure because we've got the reasonable belief that falls in one of the categories, the reasonable belief it's in the public interest. But the 
the worker then needs to be careful in terms of who they're making that disclosure to. And the starting point, and certainly this is the thrust of the legislation, is that it should be made to their employer. And if it is, it will automatically then be protected under the law. If it's not made to the employer, it can be made to a relevant responsible person. So again, if you take the example of one of your workers doing um, you know, work for a client um, and they discover some form of malpractice within that client and they reasonably believe that, that client is responsible for that, then they can make the disclosure to the client as opposed to you as their employer. And again, it will be protected. They can also make it to a legal advisor um, and it's understood that they might want legal advice at the outset in terms of their actions. We then get to slightly sort of wider categories of who it can be reported to. So the next step down is a prescribed person um, or body. And that is a, a sort of the authority in that relevant area, the organisation responsible for it. So it includes HMRC and um, the Health and Safety Exec, Charity Commission, NHS England, Financial Con Conduct Authority. If a disclosure is made to one of those organisations or bodies, um, the worker needs to show that they reasonably believe the information disclosed was substantially true. So they've got an additional hurdle they need to get over in terms of it being protected disclosure. Um, and again, if we go wider again, so um, to you know, uh, perhaps the most high profile example would be to the press, you know, if they go running off to the, the sun with a, a, what they consider to be a juicy story in terms of their employer's malpractice it's going to get increasingly hard to then bring a whistleblowing complaint um, claim off the back of it because they have to show that they've either already disclosed the information to their employer or prescribed person or they've not done so because they reasonably believe they'd be subject to a detriment uh, or their employer would look to um, destroy the evidence if they told them about it first. They also need to show that they didn't do so um, for some form of personal gain. So if you've got one of your workers who you know, sells a story to the papers um, you know, and gets a payout for it, it's going to be really hard for them to then bring a, set, a separate whistleblowing complaint in relation to that. But if they're making it to their employer or you know, someone else who's acceptable in terms of a, a prescribed person and they've satisfied the earlier tests, then they have a very clear right not to be subject to a detriment or dismissal because of their actions. And that's the protection that's afforded by the law. They don't have positive rights in terms of being you know, involved in the investigation or having any say in terms of what you then do about that disclosure, but they have the right to not be subject to a detriment or dismissal. And that's the key message to take away if you are ever dealing with a whistleblower. We just have the next slide, Tom. So um, key, uh, just a few quick key considerations for you as you know, the employer, um, if you are facing such a complaint or if a claim does, a whistleblowing claim does come in and you know, there's a few tricks that employers sometimes get wrong. Um, the important first step is to ensure that the employee is said is not subject to a detriment for raising the complaint. If they are, that's when you're going to get into hot water in terms of it becoming a legal claim. As stated at the outset, in most cases, a reasonable approach should be taken, irrespective of whether the complaint amounts to a protected disclosure or not, just in case you're getting your analysis wrong, and also to ward off other potential claims like constructive unfair dismissal. But it is important to be able to identify whether it is a protected disclosure, because clearly the ramifications of getting it wrong are more serious in that case. As, you know, as, as we've reiterated over and over again, these complaints don't normally come in neatly packaged um, under your whistleblowing policy if you have one in place. And they're often casually brought up, um, maybe by an employee who has no idea they're actually blowing the whistle. So being able to recognise when one does come in is important. Um, consider whether it's a grievance. Um, you know, case law has made it clear that a whistleblowing complaint can form a grievance. And, and that is a discussion that you should be having with the employee when it's first um, received in terms of do they want you to treat it as a grievance and go down your grievance procedure. Um, again, if not, potentially um, crazy claim for constructive unfair dismissal if the employee feels like it's not been dealt with properly and they are an employee with at least two years service. Um, importantly, don't miss a trick just because it's not new information. 
you know, we see some examples where um, an employer hasn't dealt properly with information they've received or potential protected disclosure because they say, oh, you know, I've heard this already. And particularly if you're getting complaints about perhaps a COVID related issue, then it might be that several of your workers or employees are coming to you in relation to exactly the same point. And, you know, it gets to number four, five or six or seven. And you say, look, we've, we've already had this discussion. You don't need to tell me about it. And um, if that worker is then in any way subject to a detriment for bringing it to your attention, they're going to have a potential whistleblowing claim. So just because it's not new information does not mean it doesn't form a protected disclosure. Um, I mean, I've talked a little bit already in terms of you know, the reasonable belief component. Um, but going back to my initial point, just be a little bit careful in terms of you know, carrying out this forensic analysis at the beginning and then confidently deciding it's not a protected disclosure and then treating the individual differently because of that. Um, it's still sensible to consider the complaint in any event, whether or not you, you, you think it's likely that we can show that it is in their reasonable belief in the public interest to have brought it to you um, and make sure you're not subjecting them to a detriment, um, not least because if not, you might be handing the worker a claim if you've got it wrong. And then um, just the next slide, please, Tom, thanks. Um, make sure that you know, the individuals within your organisation are aware that there is individual liability as well. Um, so a whistleblowing claim can be brought against obviously you as the employer um, and you will be vicariously liable for the acts of the individuals within your workplace, but also you can have individual respondents that are named. Um, making staff aware you know, that they have a bit of skin in the game in terms of any potential repercussions they're considering um, or steps they're considering taking against someone who's blowing the whistle can be quite an important tool in terms of keeping everyone in line and making sure there is no such detriment um, against the individual who's brought a complaint. So um, you know, bearing in mind that both the company and individuals can be named in a whistleblowing claim can be quite, as I said, helpful in terms of making sure that everyone's complying with your whistleblowing approach. Just in terms of some practical steps to take um, if you receive a whistleblowing complaint. So um, ensure the matter is investigated appropriately, as I said, both from a, you know, a good housekeeping point of view, that's sensible, but also um, in terms of your legal obligations, um, especially if it's as a health and safety issue. Um, consider how to maintain an anonymity if required. Um, Workers are often reluctant to bring a complaint to their employer's attention if they feel that their name is then going to be attached to it. Um, you know, whether realistically or not, they might have concerns in terms of how it's then have any backlash on them. So um, in your policy, you should make sure that you've got provisions in place in terms of trying to keep that um, the, the nature of the complaint anonymous as far as you practically can. Um, take any required steps in terms of resolving the matter, keep the whistleblower informed. So there's no legal requirement to, but you are massively reducing your chances of that individual then taking the information outside of the workplace if they feel that the matter is being appropriately dealt with and you're communicating to them how you are um, looking into it and trying to resolve that situation. So if you want to keep it in-house, then generally keeping the whistleblower informed will allow you to do so. And as said, the, the key protection is ensuring that the whistleblower is not treated detrimentally by you know, management or co-workers for having blown the whistle, particularly if you're not you know, in a position to be able to keep it on an anonymous basis. So do make sure that um, you, you're speaking to the relevant people and making sure that if that named person is a named individual, that, that they're not suffering in any way because they have um, made that protected disclosure. And then just last slide for me um so specifically what protections in, are in place for whistleblowers so not being subject to any detriment as i said that's got a very low threshold um a recent case found that a individual who made a protected disclosure who then effectively just had quite a strong ticking off in the workplace they were there was no formal disciplinary action taken against them but they were just told off by their manager in quite strong words um, that was enough to um, constitute a detriment and for them to bring a claim. Obviously, the conversation was reasonably low in that case, but they were still successful in their claim. Um, you have the right not to be automatically unfairly dismissed. That's for employees only. 
workers don't have unfair dismissal rights, but they, in line with that, have the right to have, not to have their contract terminated um, early because they've made a protected disclosure. Um, it's day one right, which I've already mentioned. So, you know, it's universally applied within your workplace. What can um, an individual gain if they are successful in their claim? So um, reinstatement or re-engagement for employees, which is always in practice very difficult for employers um, if they lose this form of case, in particular if you know, it's been quite an acrimonious claim and then you're having to have that person back within the workplace. There's no cap on compensation, which is partly why these claims are very attractive now um, to you know, workers and employees alike because you know, if you're an employee and you bring an unfair dismissal claim, clearly there's a cap of a year's earnings or you know, the current threshold of about 95,000. That does not exist in line with discrimination claims or whistleblowing. So there have been a few very high profile cases where individuals have been able to claim career loss um, from a successful whistleblowing claim, which is clearly very expensive for the employer. And importantly, um, and perhaps a, you know, an underused or underknown tool is that of interim relief, um, which is uh, an application that worker can make as soon as they feel they've been subject to a detriment and which Tom will talk you through in a little bit um, further detail. And talking of Tom, so that is the legal background in terms of whistleblowing, but perhaps to put it in more context, in particular, you know, with the current times, Tom is going to take you through some of the specific health and safety um, issues around whistleblowing you know, within the current COVID era. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lil. Um, that was really insightful. Uh, so I, I, as Lil said, um, my part of the talk is around health and safety and whistleblowing. So what's health and safety got to do with whistleblowing? Well, as we heard, um, one of the six uh, areas of malpractice that workers can blow the whistle in relation to is an alleged breach by the employer of health and safety. And so with the uh, global pandemic, health and safety has been uh, pushed into the foreground and lots of employers have had to deal with health and safety issues like never before. So if we have a look at the next slide, uh, we can have a bit more of a detailed look at what an employer's obligations are in relation to health and safety. Um, and broadly speaking, employers have to do everything that is reasonable to protect their workers from harm. Now, that often goes hand in hand with having a health and safety policy. Um, and those policies have had to be adapted in, in light of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And I'm sure lots of people watching this webinar will have had, had the dubious pleasure of grappling with these issues themselves in their own workplaces. and. Uh, you will know probably more than me how uh, COVID is likely to impact your particular workplace. Uh, but broadly speaking, um, there is an obligation under that banner of doing everything reasonable uh, to put in a safe system of work, the so-called COVID secure workplace. Uh, that might involve a one-way system, um, it might involve regular reminders to your employees about hygiene and hand washing. It might involve uh, isolating employees who have tested positive for coronavirus and then adapting risk assessments to suit your particular workplace and then publishing those risk assessments is also uh, a, a very good idea uh, in terms of being able to document and show that you as an organization have thought about the risks posed by COVID uh, and adapted uh, your working environment accordingly. Um, offering support and consulting with your workforce are both really important as well. Um, if you've got a trade union, um, then talking to them or a staff council or something equivalent is, is a really good way of ensuring that employees' concerns about health and safety in light of COVID can be met because employees will, like everybody in society, take different views about 
COVID and, and how it might affect them and their families. Some people might have underlying health conditions. They might feel that they're more vulnerable to COVID-19 because of their age, for example, uh, or e even their ethnicity. And so it's important not to make assumptions about the way that people will feel about uh, COVID and the prospects uh, of catching it. And so this is why consulting with your employees and offering them su su some support is um, so important in, in, in these uh, new uh, and, and strange times in which we live. So if we could have a look at the next slide, um, we can see um, some additional considerations that you might want to think about in terms of your health and safety response to uh, COVID-19. Public transport is a really interesting one because um, you're not in direct control of this. And so when your workers are traveling into work, if, if that's something that you are uh, requiring them to do, um, then there is the possibility that employees might say, well, actually, particularly if I'm clinically vulnerable, um, I don't have another way of getting to work. I have to use public transport. And I think that that, that poses a risk to me in terms of uh, catching COVID-19. Um, and there is an option for uh, employees who find themselves in what they consider to be serious and imminent danger from refusing to, to attend work or leaving work and refusing to come back or taking steps to prevent that danger. And, and if an employee finds themselves in that situation, then they have additional protection outside the whistleblowing law that uh, Lil has already been talking to you about. But under health and safety law, um, employees who find themselves in that situation and then suffer a detriment can bring uh, a separate claim under the Employment Rights Act. And if they're dismissed, then they can also bring a claim for automatic unfair dismissal. So going back to the public transport point, um, there was a, an employment appeal tribunal case of Edwards and Secretary of State for Justice, uh, which involved prison workers at, at Dartmouth Prison um, who refused to travel into work uh, when uh, there were extreme weather conditions. And in principle, that case found that that could uh, extend uh, to uh, the law could extend to employees who refused to travel into work because the journey in was unsafe rather than the environment which the employer was in control of at the other end and so it is theoretically possible uh, for employees uh, to say well, actually, I, I, don't, I, I feel that you as my employer have, have made my workplace COVID secure, but actually my journey into work uh, is, is, is going to pose a serious and imminent danger to my health and safety, and therefore I'm refusing to come into work. Um, this hasn't been tested yet uh, uh, in this current pandemic, but this is certainly something that employers... Uh, are having to grapple with. Um, so that was a, an interesting point and, and, and it would depend as to whether or not the employee in this situation is uh, in serious and imminent danger. And it would be a very fact specific decision, I think, for a tribunal to make, uh, depending on whether they have another way of traveling in, what is their underlying health condition, uh, what does the government guidance say, uh, about the way that they should be um, conducting themselves and the way that employers should be conducting themselves as well. And once all that's taken into account, it might be possible uh, for employees to bring these types of health and safety claims. So if we could have a look at the next slide, please, Tom. So in, in terms of protected disclosures, then just as a reminder, um, there needs to be a reasonable belief that the disclosure is in the public interest. Uh, it needs to be a breach of a legal obligation or in this particular case, 
a, a health and safety complaint and that an individual is likely to be or may well be in the future um, uh, um, suffering from uh, issues to do with health and safety and particularly in a coronavirus context um, or that that information is likely to be deliberately concealed and as Lil has already explained uh, it, the uh, qualifying disclosure for it to be protected needs to be made to the proper person and that's usually the employer. Uh, so I've mentioned a couple of examples of uh, COVID-19 related protected disclosures to do with your traveling into work but then again if, if uh, an employer is, is making employees work in a COVID unsecure way then I could see a number of other uh, potential examples of um, protected disclosures coming out of that situation. We've certainly had um, our own share of, of these type of issues that, that our clients have been dealing with. And as Lil's already said, it's critical that in this situation, the worker is not uh, subjected to a detriment. So if we could have a next look at the next slide, please, Tom. So that's an explanation of why um, health and safety and whistleblowing have become more, uh, have come to the fore more in the coronavirus times. But another thing that has also uh, been impacted by coronavirus is, is, is interim relief applications. And pre-coronavirus, these were really the realm of trade unionists, uh, and uh, other people who could be widely perceived as agitators, but now they are happening much uh, more frequently. Um, and it's important to explore them uh, in more detail. And you, the, the reason for, for them happening more frequently is obvious because of the increase in um, allegations and uh, protected disclosures being made against employers, either because of furlough fraud or as we've already explored health and safety. So let's have a look at interim applications, if we could see the next slide, please. So an interim relief application needs to be presented within seven days of the effective date of termination. And it needs to be presented to an employment tribunal along with a claim for unfair dismissal. Now, in this situation, there's no need to go through the normal ACAS early conciliation process um, because there just isn't time to do it and it's not a legal requirement. So um, the first that many of you as employers might see of an interim relief application is when you get notification of it by an employment tribunal. And it can be brought uh, during uh, an employee working their notice period as well um, but the employee has seven days uh, to, to, to bring the application to the attention of the tribunal as I've already said and then the tribunal will try and hear the claim as soon as possible after that so in the employment team in Sheffield we recently had a claim like this uh, and it was listed within seven days of it being received by the tribunal. So it kind of jumps the queue and, and the queue is very long in the employment tribunal as a, as a result of COVID-19. But these are cases that are prioritised. And the thing that the uh, tribunal will be looking at uh, when they're deciding whether to grant interim relief is whether or not to reinstate the employee back into their job. And that's a really powerful uh, tool to do um, because it means that the employee will then continue to be paid uh, right up until the, the, the decision that the tribunal finally makes uh, at a final hearing. And if the employer refuses to reinstate, then there is a legal requirement to continue to pay, pay the employee's salary in any event. So the leading case on the test that the tribunal will be applying when they're judging interim relief is, is a pretty ancient case in employment law terms going back to 1978. It's the case of Taplin and Shippen. And I think the age of the case gives you an idea of how rare these interim relief applications really are. 
And this case still holds true, and it's whether or not the claim has a pretty good chance of success. And broadly speaking, that does what it says, really. Is it likely to win? Has it got a pretty good chance of winning? And so the, uh, the tribunal doesn't say, will it definitely win? It doesn't say, does it have a reasonable chance of winning? It's a slightly higher threshold than that. Uh, has it got a pretty good chance of winning? So, um, as I've said, once the tribunal has decided whether or not that's the case, there's a possibility for reinstatement. But the really key thing here uh, for employers is that you've got a lot of work to do with your legal advisors in the case of seven days. So normally we would have uh, seven or eight months to prepare for an employment tribunal hearing, but we have to squash in looking for relevant documents, drafting witness statements and closing submissions to a tribunal all within the case of a week. And so you can see that it, it would have a very significant impact on uh, the way that you run your business in order to um, meet the uh, directions of the tribunal, uh, which would be uh, coming very thick and fast in this uh, particular uh, situation. And obviously, if, if interim relief is, is granted, uh, then that's going to be costly as well, because the, with the tribunal overloaded in the way it is at the moment, there is likely to be a significant delay until the final hearing. And if you're going to have to pay the employee for this period of time, then that has a significant impact. Another impact is that if a judge has take a taken a preliminary look as they do in these interim relief situations and said this has got a pretty good chance of success and you then go on and fight the claim anyway then there's a chance that the employee could say well actually um, the defense to this case didn't have reasonable prospects of success and a judge told you that at the start or and, and therefore I'm going to claim costs at the end if I win and so I think that the situation uh, is, is likely to come around more often where an employee who goes to a final hearing after making a successful interim relief application is more likely to be successful in respect of getting their legal costs paid for as well. So let's have a look at the next slide, please, Tom. So the case, uh, as I said, previously used tool, but becoming more uh, uh, more common. And one example of that that has arisen from the uh, the pandemic is Morales and, and Premier Foods uh, Limited. And this was a case involving an employee who was a member of a trade union and went to his union for support with a grievance about changes to terms and conditions that his employer was making in light of the first lockdown, uh, together with complaints that he was making about the employer's provision of PPE. And he was dismissed, uh, he was made redundant uh, as a result of, he alleged, as a result of making these claims and getting his trade union to support him with them. And uh, the Employment Tribunal had a look at that, uh, they had a look at the evidence and they thought, yeah, that might be the case. And I think actually it's more likely uh, than not that that claim is going to succeed and therefore they granted him his interim relief application. And so that employer was in the situation of either deciding, well, do I reinstate this employee or do I carry on paying this employee anyway up until uh, the final hearing? And so obviously that, that's a pretty significant uh, scenario to grapple with. So it's important that employers in this situation understand the possibility that if they do uh, terminate employees' uh, employment as a result of uh, whistleblowing allegations or membership of trade unions or, or trade union activities, then they, an interim relief uh, application might well result. And I think that, that these are going to increase in, in the future as well. Uh, and we're only seeing the start of these cases coming through. So we could have a look at the, the next slide, Tom, please. So go, going forward, what, what are the main takeaways for your business out of this webinar? Well, um, firstly, I would say um, 
whistleblowing claims don't always come neatly packaged with an email saying whistleblowing complaint at the top. In fact, sometimes employees don't even know that they're making whistleblowing complaints. Uh, that uh, 11 page grievance that you receive might have a whistleblowing complaint uh, tucked away somewhere in one of those paragraphs and the employee doesn't even know it until they take legal advice further on down the line uh, and, and then they could, their advisor will say, well, actually, I think you made a whistleblowing disclosure there. And then they get uh, to benefit from all the legal protection that Lil was talking to you about earlier. And so I think being able to spot a whistleblowing disclosure is really important. And um, so that's, that's one of the first takeaways. So if we have a look at the next slide, we'll, we'll go on to having a look at, at some of the others. Um, it, in, it, it, you know, following on from being able to spot whistleblowing complaints, um, it's an idea to have someone who is um, appointed to receive and manage those complaints. As Lil said, it's a good idea, regardless of whether something is a whistleblowing complaint or not, uh, to deal with it promptly and efficiently. And if you've got someone appointed to do that, then that would be uh, a very good idea. Um, that's sometimes someone in an HR department, or if your business isn't large enough to have its own HR department, maybe one of the directors appointed for specific responsibility of dealing with these complaints. Do you have a whistleblowing procedure or policy in place? It's a good idea to, to have one because it, it explains not only to your employees what a whistleblowing disclosure is, but it also explains to you and your managers how to deal with a whistleblowing complaint if one is made. And it would impress a tribunal that you've been through your procedure and you've dealt with a whistleblowing complaint in the right way if it ever made its way in front of an employment judge. And then have a look at potentially training your managers because, as I've said earlier, whistleblowing complaints aren't always obvious. And if your managers don't know when a whistleblowing complaint is made, then it can be difficult for you as an organisation to deal with that complaint in the right way. And above all else, communication, I think, is key. Um, having an open culture where people can question decisions that are made and they aren't brushed aside and or even worse treated detrimentally because uh, someone has uh, you know questioned the decision that has been made by management so i think it a key key to avoiding whistleblowing complaints and dealing with them in the right way is having the right kind of culture in place where you can put support in place for your employees uh, to, to challenge uh, you as your employer. Um, so that I think are the, are the key practical steps. Um, let's just roll on to the next slide if you don't mind Tom. Um, so th this is the question and answer section of, of, of the talk. Thank you very much for listening to us. Um, I'm going to get Tom now to read out some of the questions that we had um, before the webinar, before we go on to have a look at the Q&A section and the chat function to, to look at your, your questions. Perfect. Thanks very much, Tom. So the first question that we had in previously was, what do you think are the biggest barriers to encouraging employers to speak up? Do you want to take that one, Lee? I'll take that one. Um, so yeah, I think I think Tom touched on this quite a bit on, he, on his last slide. Um, if an employer's not got the systems in place to tell employees what a disclosure is, or let them know how they need to go about making a disclosure, and also guidance for managers in dealing with disclosures, then I think that can put employees off and workers off making disclosures. Um, also, it's not just having that policy in place, but it's making sure people are aware of it. So give the training to, uh, to workers, give the training to managers, um, regularly give updates that the policy is there to be used. Um, but it's, uh, as Tom also said, it's more about the culture of the organisation as well. Uh, and I think this goes further than just in relation to whistleblowing. It spans that into everything. So if you have an organisation where speaking up is welcomed, and that could be in relation to well-being, 
Um, it could be, it could be, for example, if a, a worker makes a mistake, how does the employer go about that? Um, are they punished for that mistake, or within reason? Are they given guidance? Is there a culture where uh, workers are encouraged to speak up and and share their experience? And and I think if if you have that culture, then I think it's more likely that employees will, and workers will be willing to speak up about their concerns. If, however, your culture is where things are buried under the carpet and people are discouraged from having their say and whether there's a hierarchy where people are scared of saying something about the person above them um, or something similar, then I think that can be a big barrier to some people um, in making that disclosure, uh, particularly if they're scared of the repercussions. If they do disclose about someone more senior, what's going to happen? Is it going to be addressed? Or am I just going to be bullied as a result? Um, so, yeah, I think there's some two key steps what an, an organisation can take. Um, do, do, does Elizabeth or Tom have anything to add on that? <laughs> no, I, mean, I think obviously very practical advice. A couple of points I would add. I think it's hard for smaller small organisations to do, but if you have the capacity, trying to have provisions in place to ensure that complaints can be made on an anonymous basis is key. Um, whether or not it's a realistic fear, you will probably find that your workers are worried if they make a protected disclosure in terms of any sort of blowback to them. Um, you know, however great your culture might be within your organisation, um, or just that they just don't want the the hassle or the you know the attention brought to them over it. So I think having some form where a, a process where anonymous reporting can be made and making sure that's implemented in practice can provide a lot of reassurance to workers and therefore encourage them to come forward, um, even if they don't necessarily want their name put out there. Um, and the only other point I would make is that I think that certainly in relation to you know, COVID-related issues, um, hand in hand with the pandemic is obviously a lot of job insecurity within organisations at the moment. Um, again, whether it's because your, your um, company has already gone through rounds of redundancy or it's just something that people are talking about as a potential in the future. So um, having something you know, clearly stated within your policy that you know, no detriment will be taken against the individual and again, communicating that if a complaint is brought forward, um, you know, in no way would this be taken into account. Or if it is raised by a worker as part of a redundancy process, being very clear in terms of why it has absolutely nothing to do with the um, criteria that were considered as part of the, the redundancy selection process can be reassuring. Um, because what people you don't want is people not coming forward because they're generally worried in terms of them you know, being at greater risk of redundancy. So it's handling that sensitively if you are also going through redundancy processes. Thanks, guys. Um, so the next one we've got is how wide an interpretation of employer <coughs> in the employment's right that can the tribunal use when determining a qualifying disclosure? Um, I'll, I'll talk about that because it's far within my section a little bit. Um, the first point, so this isn't actually squarely answering your question, but just a reminder that there is an extended definition of worker within the Employment Rights Act for whistleblowing protection. So if an individual can show that they're a worker for your organisation under this heading, which is wider than the traditional definition, um, and would include former workers, um, agency workers, LP members, etc. then you could be an employer um, for the purposes of um, a whistleblowing claim. But just more directly to answer your question, so um, in terms of when determining a protected disclosure has been made, so you're making a qualifying disclosure, is it to the employer? The whistleblowing provisions in the Employment Rights Act are slightly unhelpfully silent on this point. Um, and in particular, who within an organisation employer would have to make the report to for it to be considered to have been made to the employer. And um, there's no additional guidance. If you've got a policy, you can designate who um, a, a whistleblowing complaint should be made to, and that can be helpful um, if you're going to argue that it hasn't been made to you as the employer. But if you haven't, then it is a little bit up for grabs in terms of who's who's got the better argument as to whether it's been made to an appropriate person within your organization my view is if it's to someone more senior then the employee is automatically going to be considered um a qualifying disclosure um to the employer if it's someone on their level 
or to someone more junior, you have got some form of argument that it's not a protected disclosure, it's not been made to the employer, but it's one that would be risky to make. Um, and I think a tribunal would try and find a way around it. In particular, if they're ticking all the other whistleblowing boxes and they then suffer a detriment because they made that protected disclosure. So perhaps they made it to a colleague on the same level or a junior who then passed it on to someone more senior who then subjected that individual to a detriment. I think they are then going, the tribunal is going to find a way to then label that as a, a relevant protected disclosure. So as a legally, there's no clear statement in terms of how wide the definition of employer is. But I think if it's made to anyone within your organization, there's going to be an argument that that constitutes the employer. I hope that answers your question, but if not, come back on the, the Q&A. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, so the next one we've got is, how do whistleblowing policies fit in with the duty to report to a regulator? Um, so, yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so, it, as Elizabeth said earlier in the talk, um, in order for disclosures to be uh, protected disclosures, they need to be made to uh, the employer or a re responsible person. But protected disclosures can also be made to prescribed persons. So they are, there's a list of prescribed people in the legislation and, and they include HMRC, Ofcom, the HSE, the Charity Commission, NHS England, Financial Conduct Authority or the ICO. And so you, you can see that there, there are other avenues for employees to make protected disclosures. Um, but if they're not going to make a protected disclosure uh, to an employer, then there is a higher threshold of what amounts to a protected disclosure in law. So the law does encourage employees to make the disclosure to the employer first. But for whatever reason, if the employee or the worker doesn't think that the employer is the correct person to make the disclosure to or uh, the, the, the employee the, or the worker doesn't think that uh, the employer will deal with it in the right way or they may suffer a detriment, um, then the worker needs to have a reasonable belief, firstly, that the prescribed person has the remit to deal with the disclosure, and secondly, that the information and the allegation made are substantially true substantially true so that's slightly different from a protected disclosure that's made to an employer where the employee only has to have a reasonable belief that the information that they are disclosing tends to show uh, a breach of one of the things that Lil was talking about earlier most commonly uh, a, a breach of a legal obligation so there is a higher hurdle if uh, employers employees or workers are going to make protected disclosures to prescribed persons. And uh, the question was, was around how it, in, employment policies and HR policies link into this. Most whistleblowing policies will say that, will encourage employees to make disclosures to you as an employer so that you can deal with those disclosures without the need to go to a prescribed person. Uh, and, and so that's another benefit of having a whistleblowing policy in place so that you as the employer can see that uh, disclosure and deal with it appropriately without the need to uh, take that, uh, without the need for your workers to take protected disclosures outside your organisation. There is also a wider uh, disclosure possibility that Lil touched on earlier in relation to the media, uh, the police or regulators, and, and the, the hurdle is even higher than a disclosure to a prescribed person if a worker is going to make that kind of wider disclosure. Um, and in that situation, unless there are exceptional circumstances, the disclosure needs to have been made internally to the employer first. There needs to be the belief that the allegations are substantially true again, uh, and there needs to be a reasonable belief that the worker will suffer a detriment or the evidence will be destroyed before the worker uh, can make that kind of wider disclosure without going to the employer first. So 
Um, I hope that kind of answers your question. It's another reason to have a, a whistleblowing policy in place um, so that it's clear to your workers who are thinking about making protected disclosures the right order in which to do that. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, one for Elizabeth. So you mentioned that judges are in. What about non-legal members of the Employment Tribunal? Oh, good question. Um, I'm not aware that there's been any case law on this point. Lee and Tom can point out not. But um, it would be interesting to make the argument that they are protected in line with judges. So judges, again, on a kind of square reading of the legislation, fall outside of whistleblowing protection as an office holder. But the argument that was made in the case where a judge was found to have protection was that they needed to to give um, effect to their convention right for freedom of expression. Um, and the Human Rights Act has an article that states that you need to give effect to convention rights. Um, you need, legislation needs to be read in line with convention rights and it was held that it wasn't because judges didn't have freedom of expression because they didn't have whistleblowing protection. So I imagine that a, a similar argument could be made in terms of other panel members if they're sitting in a sort of judicial capacity, um, you know, say wing members in a tribunal, that you're effectively blocking their convention right um, by not affording them this protection. But as far as I'm aware, it's never been tested. So it would have to be um, a case that was determined on its facts. But I can't see why necessarily the distinction would be made between them um, and the judge um, if whistleblowing protection is going to be extended. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, have any of the panel ever blown the whistle? And if so, what was the context and what was the outcome? Oh, yes, that um, I can. Well, I, my answer to that would be certainly not formally um, and you know classic example of I might have raised issues within a workplace over the last 10 years which would constitute a protected disclosure but not necessarily done so knowingly or you know with a view to making protected disclosure but I think it's probably quite easy if you're you know complaining about anything within to your employer um, obviously not police for that to then you know be a protected disclosure even if you're not actually aware that you're doing it so I don't know is the answer to that. Um, I, 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 um, I, I'm probably quite lucky. I don't think I've been in a position where I've even thought uh, about the possibility of making a, a protected disclosure. I'm, I'm sorry if that's not a very, uh, there's a bit of a boring answer to that question. Yeah, my, my answer's a bit boring too. I'm probably like Elizabeth, I, I might have. Um, we all like to have them on now and again. Not, not since I've been at Free Use, but uh, jobs before that. Um, and may, maybe I have made a disclosure, but no, I've, I've never gone and set out to make a whistleblowing disclosure. Uh, so sorry if that, yeah, that's not the most exciting answer to that question. I just think of any waitressing jobs I might have had, you know, 15 years ago, if I complained about it being a bit dirty in the kitchen or something, whether that would have qualified, but not, not to my knowledge, not for a long time. Real. Okay, so if Redundancy Notice started before the 1st of December, can you continue to claim for it or can an employer only claim for part of the notice up to the 30th of November? Um, I'll take that one um, since that's my part of the talk. So um, the guidance suggests that um, notice served up until the end of November can be claimed for under the furlough scheme and then any um, notice served after that would not be eligible to be claimed for. Um, the, the Treasury direction, which we recently uh, released, which implements, so that's the law that implements the scheme, does not say that notice cannot be claimed before then. So I think it is probably safe to assume that you can, but as always these days, that's subject to the next lot of guidance, what comes out, but as things stand, it looks like, yeah, notice before, it, notice before December can be claimed. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm just conscious of time, so we'll probably do one, maybe two more questions before we finish. Um, so are there circumstances in which the seven day deadline for interim relief could be extended? I'm thinking of employees who have been made redundant and haven't realised it linked to whistleblowing. Um, no, there, 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 are, there are very, it's very strictly applied, uh, the, the rules. Um, and I have, I'm not aware of any case law in which that seven day deadline has been extended. Um, 
there, there might be the opportunity for it to be extended in a situation where it wasn't reasonably practicable to bring the claim within time, which I suppose is, is what's being alluded to in the question. Um, but I think you'd have to take specific legal advice uh, if you were thinking about bringing an interim relief application, um, particularly about it in a situation where you're not within that seven days. Um, you, you're already facing an uphill battle with the tribunal um, in, in that situation. So I would encourage you to take some legal advice if that ever came to, into being. Perfect, thank you. So other than enabling anonymous concerns to be raised, has anyone come up with a good way to convince employees that retribution is not allowed and action will be taken if such a thing does happen? So I think this person's concerned that a lot of employees come up to them uh, and say that they fear that reprisals, um, so they don't want to make the complaints in that, that sense. Sorry, Tom, so do you mean it other than just providing reassurance that their name will be kept out of it? Yeah, so how, how, how do they go about convincing employees that, um, although you've got the anonymous aspect, that they won't be reprimanded for, for making a complaint? Um, I think my advice would be if they think that, it might, be, it might help to get to the bottom of why they think that. So if before someone's made a disclosure and they have faced retribution, that might be what's stopping them from making a disclosure. So if you get to the bottom of the reasons and that might help you to address it. And then I think that comes back to the culture as well. If, if you're, if you adopt as an organization, that positive speak up culture, then you're probably less likely to think that they are going to be disadvantaged for making a disclosure. I think that's not something you can sort of click your fingers and achieve, but it's something which you sort of do over time. Um, so yeah, that, that'd be my advice. Yeah. All I'd add to that as well, I think two points, communication, so making sure the employee's got a clear line of communication to a named individual who they feel comfortable with, who they can come to if they feel that there have been any repercussions, so that they know that, you know, what do I do in practice if this does happen? And secondly, um, making it clear in your policy and also, again, communicating that to the employee that if anyone is subjecting them to a detriment in any way within the workplace, that's taken very seriously by the organisation and is likely to you know, lead to potential disciplinary proceedings so that they know that if they do come back and report that anything has happened, that it won't just be whitewashed and steps will be taken to address it. Perfect. Thanks very much. I've just gone to the time, so what I'll do is we'll end it there, and then if there's any questions that have come in that we've not answered, we'll follow up directly following the webinar, and the recording will be out later this week uh, for you all to receive as well. So thanks very much for attending. Thank you very much for the panellists. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Sure.